Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Welcome to the moon. I'm your host for this evening, Lawrence Ray. And today I am joined by my fantastic co host, Ricardo Martinez and Jerry. Uh, but most importantly, today we are interviewing Bitcoiner Herman Vivier of Bitcoin Akazi, uh, a project I believe inspired by Bitcoin Beach, in which a Bitcoin economy is being created in South Africa. Uh, Herman, how are you doing today? How's it, man? Yeah, doing all right. Doing all right. Hanging Cracking. in there. <laughs> yeah, we, uh, we like to go for a quick intro, get straight to business. Now that messing around. But yeah, I guess, um, well, the first question that will be a good place to start off will be for you to tell us, hey, Bitcoin Akazi, what's it about? What's the basics? Just so people listening can understand and get completely up to speed with the knowledge that we all have here about the, the project, the simple stuff. Yeah, cool, man. I'll give you a quick overview. Um, I mean, it's basically literally inspired directly by, <clears throat> by Bitcoin Beach. Um, we're also supported by Bitcoin Beach at the moment. Um, and we are, we're basically just trying to copy paste um, what they did in a, in a different setting. So obviously we're adapting it to local circumstances. Um, not everything is a straight copy paste, but um, yeah, it's, 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 it's an adaptation of, of what they did there. So basically we, we're trying to kickstart a Bitcoin circular economy um, in a South African township. Um, it's a very poor neighborhood. Um, and we're using as a platform, we're using a nonprofit organization that my wife and I have been running for the last 10 years. Um, so we've got a, we've got a pretty solid um, platform in the community. Uh, we've been working with with them uh, for for several years. We have coaches who have been running this program um, since 2016, 2017, um, and and we're using that NPO as a as a trusted foot in the door, um, which is kind of similar to what what how it developed with Bitcoin Beach. They had pre existing programs, um, which they then um, used to implement uh, Bitcoin in the community. Yeah, and we were talking to um, Bitcoin Lake as well, which in Guatemala, I think it was from memory. And um, similarly, they didn't have an MPO, but they were like already had been in the area quite a lot doing work. And so it, they, they kind of knew the area and, and knew um, kind of how Bitcoin could help. When it comes to where you guys are, uh, I guess when it goes back to you starting the MPO, like what's the story behind that originally with yourself and your wife like deciding to do that? Was it um like are you from like near near to the area or like what's the story around around that um we we started a business um a tourism business in 2010 and we wanted to give people who come on our on our on our trips uh, we organized two week holiday holiday surf trips and uh, we wanted to give tourists a slightly different experience um, South Africa, just as a bit of historical context, um, <clears throat> I think most people are quite familiar with the history, but it's a, it's a, it's a very, very divided society. So because of the history with apartheid, there's inequality in lots of countries around the world, but in South Africa, it's particularly pronounced. You could literally cross the highway from one side to another, um, and there would be $10 million mansions on the one side and people living in, in absolute nothing nothingness on the other side of the highway. So it's a very divided society. Um, the one thing that, that makes it strange is that, is that because of the history, the, you, you, can, you can kind of feel like you're visiting Europe when you're visiting South Africa um, because the inequality is hidden from view. It's not, it's not an obvious, um, obvious sight. Um, it's, it's normally hidden around the corner or whatever. Um, and this is also because of the historic history in South Africa. So we wanted to give tourists a a, a taste of, of what it's really like for millions of people living in South Africa, rather than just have them have a very typical tourist experience. Um, so, so we developed the NPO with, with that idea in mind um, to incorporate that with the, with the tourism and, and give people just a, a slightly more, you know, a realistic taste of, of, of what the country um, what the country is like uh, behind the scenes, because it's really easy to miss um, traveling the regular tourist routes. Um, it's not it's not the kind of inequality that's in your face. Um, it's very pronounced, but you kind of have to seek it out to experience to experience it. Gotcha. So it sounds like it's kind of like you kind of got to yeah take some some like turns that usually tourists wouldn't take maybe, and then it's right there. 
but like oh. yeah you usually just wouldn't have to go like left and right off the side of the main street that you're told to go on maybe by like yeah. tourist guys that's, that's interesting and so then obviously you guys decide to do that to kind of give people the reality of the situation and then and show them what's going on and then it's like okay well let's also like start to set up the mpo and try to help the people in the local area kind of you know improve and, and not be in that situation which is pretty cool um so yeah i guess and then when, when was it that you realized hey this is something that i can kind of you know you, when did you see the bitcoin beach side of things and go oh this actually could work like uh, is it have you been someone who's been in, interested in bitcoin for a while or like was it bitcoin and then you found out about that then this or was it that this got you interested in bitcoin or how's this kind of story around around that like the switch from the mpo to going okay let's turn this into like a, a bitcoin related project yeah it's uh it's, it's it's an interesting question um i've i've been I've, I've been very very interested in bitcoin for for a long time um i i was originally introduced by a friend of mine who gave me a copy of bitcoin magazine in 2013 um vitalik was still writing for for the magazine back then um and and it struck me as something that that's kind of like um I don't know how to put it, but it's it's it it was a fast fascinating occurrence to me that you had this thing where there was very very strict rules according to how you could operate within the system, but those rules were not under the control of a particular group of people, and that just seemed inherently fair to me. Um, I've obviously been very interested in fairness, um, <laughs> seeing seeing the <laughs> the line of work that I'm in, um, and. Yeah, I just I, I I read up about it as much as I could, um, but I only really thought about incorporating Bitcoin into the NPO when I when I heard an interview with Michael Peterson, um, and so that was in late two thousand and nineteen for the first time I, I heard him on the on the What Bitcoin Did podcast. Um, Peter McCormack interviewed him, um, and and even even the host. Um, McCormack wasn't particularly he wasn't really sold on the idea and they were still it was still very early days um they hadn't really gotten the circular economy thing going yet um but but the idea was kind of it it, it struck me because I mean I'd, I'd obviously been into Bitcoin for a long time but I realized um that Bitcoin was going to have to be used by everyday people as an ordinary part of life if it's going to accomplish what it's promising um, to accomplish, it's not going to do much for the world if Bitcoin is just something that a fringe minority of people are investing is in as a speculation um, against the collapse of currencies or whatever. You know, it's it's actually going to have to be used on a daily basis uh, for it to develop, sort of deliver on its promise. Um, and so, when when I heard Mike talk about what they were doing. I thought that was a very clever way um, to get it into the hands of people um, who would use it as an ordinary currency rather than a speculative asset. Um, so that was yeah, that was late 2019. Um, but I kind of had to wait for the NPO to to actually get a Bitcoin donation before we could get going. I wasn't going to use funds from the NPO from the NPO's bank account to go and buy a Bitcoin to start this thing. So kind of sat with the idea and then in mid 2021 somebody um, donated some some bitcoin to to the npo and i thought okay well you know that's kind of not a risk-free way of starting it but it's it's a way that's gonna you know limit the risk as far as possible um, herman i wanted to ask you uh, you just mentioned donations is are you guys existing solely on donations as the source of Bitcoin? Because I interviewed Warren Gray of Currency, and he was explaining to me that South Africa has like some strange exchange laws, um, which creates kind of like a premium on Bitcoin, and it's harder to acquire there than it is in, in other places. Um, yeah, we are we are basically we are basically taking the donation model that we had for the NPO and just switching it over to a Bitcoin standard. So we are asking for Bitcoin, Bitcoin donations rather than fiat donations, but the, but the NPO was a hundred percent donation based before we um, started Bitcoin Ikasi. And now with Bitcoin Ikasi, it's still hundred percent donation based. It's just that the donations are coming in in Bitcoin rather than fiat. Um, 
And to your second question, yes, South Africa has very, very historic, historically very strict uh, exchange controls. Um, it's very difficult to move money in and out of the country. Um, if, if, for example, somebody donated $100 in cash um, to our NPO, I'd actually ask the person to go and exchange that for me because as a South African, I can't actually exchange foreign currency. I can't walk into a bank or a bureau to change at the airport and change currency unless I had a foreign passport. Um, and even if I had a foreign passport, um, if there was any form of permanent residence stamped in that passport, then I still wouldn't be able to change it. So yeah, exchange controls are pretty strict. It, it leads to a, it, it's not a massive premium. It's probably, a, it's probably about 5%. Um, so if you take the price of Bitcoin on international exchanges, um, and you convert the price with the dollar rand exchange rate, the Bitcoin price in South African rand is always slightly higher. Um, there is a bit of a bit of a premium on it. It's 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 historically been you are don't quote me on this, but it's probably about five five percent, not not much not much more than that. It's interesting on the different like uh, premiums that get paid in different countries and, and for the various reasons why. And I, and I know there was the. Was it this year or last year? Last year, where they they did this whole yeah the whole rule about like people had uh, exchanges and stuff couldn't like it was all to do with like uh, the money not leaving the country right there was this whole tightening up on that I saw that that occur and then I saw those people saying well actually it's uh, Bitcoin is uh, legal tender in El Salvador so does that consist as like a, a foreign currency rather than like a commodity or a, uh, et cetera et cetera so I thought it was quite interesting to see that um, I don't know what, what the outcome of that ever was but I know that the rules haven't changed around like uh, the Bitcoin, the crypto slash money leaving the country is part of the exchange uh, process. So I know a lot more people went uh, peer to peer in South Africa at around that time, which makes sense. And in Nigeria, the same thing happened as well around peer to peer. Yeah, there's some, um, there's some, there's some even stricter rules coming if I understand it correctly. Um, I think okay. the rule that you might be referring to is called the travel rule. So they don't. They, they actually want to try and implement it in a way that whatever Bitcoin is bought on South African exchanges is not transferred to wallets that are hosted outside of the South African jurisdiction. I don't know how they're going to try and enforce that. Um, but it's it's something that's obviously been discussed in, in many other places around the world as well. Um, I think governments in general have quite a big problem with the, the idea of self-hosting hosting your funds <laughs> um, because if it's on the blockchain, there is no jurisdiction really. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think, yeah. I think the rules are going to become even stricter. This is the thing, like a lot of uh, companies when it comes to like custody and well, a lot of the regulations in different like Southeast Asian countries. And then, as you said, South Africa has the travel rule. And a lot of it is like, uh, Oh, if you're starting an exchange in this country, you have to hold the funds in the country. And it's like, well, I mean, <laughs> how would you how do you know? I, you know it's like okay we could use a custody provider we could just you could go and use like one of the random custody like bitgo fire fire blocks whatever and then you could be like oh well where's the money and it's like well on the blockchain <laughs> i don't really like who has the paper with the keys written on them is that what we're getting at like it's a little bit weird like and i don't think they quite understand it but i saw a article from i think it was uh, on the news about the uk and then they and they apparently have no issue with self-hosted wallets or something to that effect which was at least something encouraging in this world of governments hating crypto. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting development, that's for sure. Regarding your work with um, Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin Akasi, uh, how far have you come when it comes to achieving your goals? And, you know, what are the biggest challenges you face? You know, going around, you know, preaching the gospel of Bitcoin, obviously, I, from personal experience, you know, might not go down well with um, constituted authority. And so what are the biggest challenges if you faced, you know, trying to, you know, reach your goals for the circular economy? By and far, one of the biggest challenges um, is the, the belief that Bitcoin is a scam. So we, we run into that a lot. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, in, in the beginning, Bitrefill was one of the most convenient and easily accessible ways to actually demonstrate to people that it's not a scam, uh, particularly because, you know, if, if, if you can buy phone credits and you can instantly exchange something for, for something like phone credits, people would, you know, sort of take notice and go, oh, that's interesting. Um, but uh, still, I mean, it's been, 
it's coming up on a year now um, that we've been 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 trying to implement this, and there's still a very very um, a, a, very, a lot of a lot of mistrust um, in in something like this. It's it's obviously unfamiliar. Um, people have a people have a general mistrust of the banking system in South Africa. So you would see, I mean, it's 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 quite strange. I'm not sure why South Africa has not really had the history with um, with banking scandals. Uh, it's 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 got a very tightly regulated banking sector, very conservative laws that govern banks. Um, but still, on, on payday, you would see long queues outside the cash machines. People literally withdraw everything from their bank account um, and would live, you know, on a day-to-day -day with physical hard cash. So something, something that's digital like Bitcoin sort of reminds people of, you know, this money that you can't touch. So they prefer paper, paper currency. Um, so that's been yeah it's it's been it's been tough to convince people that it's that it's real money. Um, that's that's been really tough. Uh, obviously, the other challenge is the volatility. Um, that's uh, that's quite a big challenge. Um, we've been trying to deal with that by just keeping things as small as possible. Um, you know, we haven't gone all out, and we haven't convinced anyone to convert their life savings into Bitcoin. <laughs> it's a it's a sort of a day to day. Um, we're trying to encourage people to use it on a daily basis, but only hold what they can afford to lose, um, if that makes sense. So if they're holding it for the long term, we kind of try and reiterate the point again and again that if you're going to hold on to this for the long term, then this should be something that you don't need um, urgently ever. Um, so it's, yeah, the volatility is a really big risk. Um, I'd say those are the two biggest two biggest challenges for sure. In El Salvador, uh, where Bitcoin Beach was inspired, the population uh, doesn't really have a lot of access to the banking system. What is the situation like in South Africa? Does the average South African have access to like a bank account or or banking services? Um, I think last time I checked, um, about forty percent of South Africa was unbanked. So it's not it's not as high a percentage, not nearly as high a percentage as 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 it is in El Salvador. South Africa has a pretty a pretty well developed uh, banking banking industry. Um, cash machines are are widespread. Um, one of the one of the very convenient things that you can do with the banking system in South Africa is you can actually send somebody cash, even if they haven't got a bank account, as long as you've got a bank account. Um, you literally send them a PIN number to their phone and then they could go to the relevant cash machine and by entering the PIN number, withdraw cash from the cash machine without actually having a bank account. Um, it's quite convenient because there are cash machines everywhere. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't say South Africa has a, has a major problem with, um, with, with an unbanked population. Obviously, 40% is not insignificant. Um, it's still it's still a significant amount of of, of people in the country, um, and then obviously combined with the general distrust in the banking system, uh, a lot of people aren't actually using their bank accounts for anything other than receiving a salary and withdrawing every last cent of it the day that they receive their salary. So a lot of people would literally literally receive their pay into their bank account and then the day that they get paid they would go to the nearest atm and withdraw everything in cash um so so there is there is that there is that distrust um so but but in general in general i'd say south africa is pretty well pretty well serviced um financially it's it's not it's not not the same as what you i think in el salvador it's something like 70 percent um unbanked um, which is obviously much higher. So maybe you compare South Africa's forty, you said pro approximately, um, and the UK is approximately four. So it's like a, it's a pretty big difference from you know like what I've grown up in, uh, right? So like um, to me, if someone says forty percent, that sounds like a pretty big amount of people um, that are unbanked. Um, and it's interesting you say about like the distrust in banks and people receiving and then withdrawing their salary into into cash um i may have like zoned out for a second and missed like why that is like why is it that people have such a distrust like is there a history of um banks collapsing or like governments taking money out of the bank like in other countries or 
or, or is like why is that yeah it, it, it's 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 strange i it, it's definitely not because there's a history of of banks collapsing south africa's banking system is very very tightly regulated um the banks are quite conservative um you know interest rates have never really been below six percent here um so it's 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 quite a it's quite a conservative conservatively regulated industry so i've never experienced a bank a bank run in my lifetime and, and neither of my parents i think it's got to do with um it's, it's got to do with more with a general mistrust of the government and authority figures in general obviously with south africa's history being what it is um you know 90 percent of the population are black and they have been well basically screwed over for for generations um you know first through slavery and then apartheid um as, as recently as you know the, the early 90s um and so that that general mistrust of authority figures and kind of like sort of taking anything coming from an authority figure with a, with a heavy dose of skepticism. I think it's got more to do with that. Um, but that's a very generalized sentiment. I mean, it's hard to pinpoint exactly why um, people, I mean, and, and the queues are ridiculous at the cash machines on payday. It's like, you know, these massive queues, people wait hours just to withdraw their cash. It's, 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 it is strange that they don't trust the banking system.